Welcome to the Evolve WMMA podcast featuring women who go against conventional thinking to pursue their dreams. These warriors have gained respect by taking the reins to create progressive change in a male-dominated arena. They have inspiring stories to share filled with real-life joy, passion, blood, sweat, and tears. Hey, 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 this is Evolve WMMA, and I'm your host, Shelly Devine. This week's guest is a former All-American lacrosse player and neuroperformance coach for athletes. She teaches boxing to Parkinson's patients. She is an amateur MMA and Muay Thai fighter who has used her fight training and her education in neural performance to alleviate pain and ADHD. She is now a student at Columbia University for pre-med and hopes to put together a neural program for learning disabilities with an emphasis on movement based in martial arts. I'd like to welcome Rebecca Moore. Hey. Hey, how are you? I'm good, I just got out of training. Exhausted, but. Oh, I bet. The life is good. You're preparing for a fight. Preparing for a fight, preparing for a tournament. Yes, yeah. in uh, about a week and a half. Wow, how many women are in the tournament? Um, I'm not totally sure. I think right now there are three women signed up in my bracket, which is um, uh, by weight class. So it's three people. I'm sure there are going to be a few additions uh, later on, but I don't know. I can handle three. Yeah, right? <laughs> So you probably have three matches. Oh, your phone blinked. Oh, there you go. There you're on again. Good. I'm glad you're here. So the other thing too is you just completed a, your finals, right? For uh, midterms, yeah. Midterms. That was rough. Yeah, a couple of real late nights and then showing up to training in the morning. Uh, but I got through it. It was a, luckily all condensed into one week, so... I don't know if I could have sustained that for a couple weeks in a row, but I, I worked through it. It's all about time management. Yeah. Not, wow. it's, also right. it's not much of a social life right now, so it's possible. I, I, can, I can imagine. That must be really um, very, very intense. And plus, you're, you're training for a fight at the same time. I'm like, how? Do, yeah, like, what's your time management like for that? I mean, you have to, I mean, you're studying, you're, you're pre-med, so it's yeah. like, that's well, time management, time management is, is like, that's a huge struggle for me anyway. Um, I'm very ADHD. Um, part of why I got into fighting, I mean, fighting has been great for it. But uh, it's, it's about planning ahead. So I've got um, a couple times a week, I check in with myself. And the biggest planning is actually meal prep. So I need to make enough food and have enough food for the week and after and I mean I'm gone all day so I wake up in the morning I pack like two meals in my bag and I just need to make sure I'm where I need to be um, like at the right time but it's it, yeah it's just a, uh, a couple days a week I just reassess I make sure I have enough food I figure out where I need to be and when I need to be there so I can just autopilot it um, for the rest of the week so um, yeah, I mean, it's it's about making it as autopilot as possible. It's uh, so I don't have to waste energy thinking about wait, what am I going to eat today? What do I need to buy? I condense all of that energy into one day a week or two days a week, and I just go on autopilot for the rest of it. So I can use all my energy for training or studying or whatever I need to do. Yeah, do you uh, do you have to cut weight for this fight too? Or yeah, it's been, it was wow. it started out as a 20, 20 pound cut. Wow. Um, I'm down seven or eight pounds in uh -huh. about four or five weeks. Uh -huh. Um, and I've got about a week and a half left. I'm about, what am I right now? I'm uh, 144 this morning. Uh -huh. So what is it? Like 12 pounds or 13 pounds left to go. 10 of which is, uh, water. So uh -huh. I'm, I'm pretty close. I mean, I'm in a good place. That's um, good. the weight falls off in the last week. So. Yeah. But yeah, that's by far the, the hardest part of the whole ordeal. Wow. And so you're, you're training at Henzo Gracie's now too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is, is this the first fight 
camp that you've had um, in in this school at, at Henzo Gracie's? Yes, it was a long process breaking into it. Um, I I mean, changing gyms is a is a huge. I mean, it, it takes a long time and uh, to get the trust of your coach, get the trust of your teammates. Um, and then figure out how a fight fits into your own life is, I mean, that's hard enough, but adapting to a new gym is a long process. And especially because, um, I mean, in Boston, I've got, I've got lots of contacts. People kind of know who I am. Yeah. Uh, or if they don't know who I am, they know who other, I mean, people I train with are. Yeah. So it's easy to break into those teams. I came to New York. I knew nobody in New York. I don't know anybody in the fight scene in New York. And it's a small community down here, but I'm very separated from it. So. I had to start from beginner's classes to, to get to intermediate classes to elite oh classes and then finally onto the team. And, yeah. uh, you had to now, prove yourself, huh? Yeah, I had to prove myself. You know what? That, that's a, I, I miss that, actually. I, it keeps you honest. It keeps you – I mean, after a while, you get comfortable. You know who you're training with. And uh, it's, it's important to go – to be humbled again, to be nobody. And, yeah, uh, yeah it, and I, it, it pays off. It's, it's, it's paid off a lot of my training. I've gotten a lot better. That's great. That's great. So um, you're, you're doing a Muay Thai uh, kickboxing tournament. I, there's actually one happening here in two weeks. Yeah, like the 20th. Um, and there's some women that are going to be in that. So I just thought it was very interesting, this Muay Thai tournament type stuff, like last woman standing kind of thing. And, and you're in one out in Iowa. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I and um you don't you have no idea who you are going to fight. Are they paying all the expenses to get you out there and everything too or? No, I'm in I'm in charge of that. Um that's that's the one uh I mean, that's the one downside of the tournaments is that you're in charge of getting yourself there. You've got to uh pay to participate. Um it's very much like the jiu-jitsu um tournament mm -hmm. circuit. Uh whereas in fights, I mean, you get money for ticket sales. They, they want you there. Sometimes they'll fly you out. Um, tournament, it's like, it's, you go there, you pay your own way, you prove yourself. Um, but it's a good experience. I've never done a tournament before. Never done a tournament. Never yeah. fought more than once in a day. Right. So that'll be a, a new experience for me. So do you have a coach that's going with you or how's that working out? Yep. I've got a coach going with me. Um, and I've got, uh, three other teammates who are fighting. Nice. So, so we, I mean, we've got hotel rooms together. We're all working together. I mean, they're, they're, that also helps too. I mean, I've got some, some alpha female teammates who are in charge of all this. So as I'm right. struggling and losing weight, they're like reminding me about my plane ticket, telling me to like about, uh, I don't know, all the logistics, helping me get my, my hotel room. So I'm, I'm lucky with that one. Yeah. Well, what a, what a time to pick to, you know, um, compete for one while you're in school going for pre-med. I mean, that, that when you told me that, I was like, oh my word. I was like, she's nuts. <laughs> How well, could you the, thing is, the thing that's great about what fighting has done for me, because I mean, I, I was... I was a good student, but I'm not a balanced student. Uh, I, I've always been very, like... Uh, school has always given me a lot of anxiety. I mean, it's a lot of extra work. I'm not a great reader. Mm -hmm. uh, but after school, I mean, I I, give, I think I give a little bit of background in my, like I was telling you about this. I had a lot of neck pain and it really yeah. made my ADHD a lot worse. I mean, if you're in pain all the time, mm -hmm. you're, it's really hard to focus. Um, so I got into fighting like to get, because that's the only time it got rid of my pain. And at mm -hmm. the same time, it helped me get, like, it, it helped me, calm down in the like under pressure and it it gave me a different perspective on learning right I go in there I get beat up every single day but I keep showing up and that's how you get better and it's it's a humble humbling thing whereas in school I think a lot of people go into school and I, I mean me me too like where some days yeah there's just no off days every time you have an off day it shows up in your grade so you you have to do really well all the time and I think that shoots people's anxiety through the roof so I'm used to getting knocked down every single day, and that's really helped um, me become a student, right? He, like, I, I'm not a perfectionist like I was before, and it actually is better. I'm not, I'm, 
I'm, I'm doing well and I'm learning a little bit every day. I'm more focused on the process than I was on the, than I am on the grades. So I'm actually retaining information a lot more. I, I approach my schoolwork a lot like I approach martial arts. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot different than how I did it undergrad and it, it's paying off. It's really paying off. That's awesome. I mean, uh, what, what, what caused your neck pain, do you think? Um, it's a lot of things. I mean, with all my ADHD, I, I mean, I was prescribed Adderall and that like, increases a ton of sympathetic tone and sympathetic, I mean, a sympathetic response gets you, your head forward posture a lot. Um, mm. I, I played a lot of sports uh, I, and I've had injuries, concussions, uh, hockey, it's very like lean forward posture, studying it's a lean forward posture, but in general, anxiety shoots your head forward. It gets your shoulders shrugged. I mean, everybody's had that kind of tension before. Yeah, yeah, I have it. <laughs> yeah, we all have I it. I got like pain here all the time. Yeah, when you're on a stimulant, it's just so much worse. I mean, you'll go at the end of the day, and it's your your muscles are just cramped up. And it was, I mean, I was on it for years. I was on it for years, and. Um, it helped in a lot of ways, but it also tore me down in a lot of other ways. So I had to learn how to go to school without the medication mm -hmm. because it's a quality of life thing, right? Yeah. It's, it's not worth being a doctor if I'm in pain all the time. It's not yeah. worth do like chasing after things if my quality of life is terrible. Right. So, so can you? Day. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit about the the, the neural performance? I really don't know what that is and um, how it helps people and how you kind of came about, um, you know, discovering that and that you wanted to, you know, study that and become a, a, a neural performance, what, coach? Yeah. yeah. So I, uh, right after college, um, I, like I said, I wanted to get out of pain. That was my first, I wanted to get off the, the medication. I want to get off the Adderall and I wanted to get out of pain. So I got a job as a clinical assistant at a, functional neurology clinic, which is, uh, they're, they're chiropractors, um, but they have uh, specialized, uh, they're specialized in neuroscience and dealing with um, neuro problems without the use of medication. Um, I was really lucky to stumble upon it. Um, I was going to them as a chiropractor, mm -hmm. um, but they were doing really cool, and I was so desperate to get out of pain. I was, I really uh, sort of clung to it, right? I really, I really wanted to try that modality of, um, I don't know, rehab. Mm. So I got introduced to it that way. Um, and then, uh, I mean, all the while I was fighting, I was trying to integrate it into my fighting. Um, I, I stepped away from it for a while. And then I was, I mean, I've, I'd heard about it through the functional neurology clinic. Um, but I, 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 was re I, I was told about this program called Z Health a little bit afterwards, and I was I was like you know what I, I really this is my favorite modality this is the, the philosophy behind it I really like um, and I started taking classes with them and what they do is they use movement and um, vestibular and uh, proprioceptive and uh, visual training to get people out of pain and actually perform better, right? I mean, we go to, a lot of times we go to doctors um, because we've got something wrong with us, right? Yeah. We go to a doctor, we're, we're great, we want to, we're, we're okay and we want to get better. Yeah. This was more go geared towards people who are good and want to get better, but it also, I mean, it also works the other way. It also gets you out of pain. And I, I like that attitude. I like that point of view, right? I might, like, Absolutely. I can get through my day but I want to be drugs, drugged. right? Without, without medication, right? Is it? Yeah. yeah. All without medication. Yeah. And, and it, and it has a lot of breathing stuff with it too. A lot of nutrition stuff with it too. And I just kept taking classes. I loved it. Mm -hmm. Um, one day I woke up in the middle of one of my seminars. I, I mean, it was like the second day of the seminars. We did a lot of breathing work. I woke up and it was first time in eight years I've been out of pain and it was oh, man. amazing. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's really cool. I, I may have to so, talk to you after this and, and, and find out because I, I, I've been to, the, to a doctor's a lot. I actually had, I, I think, TMJ a little bit and had mm -hmm. uh, wisdom te impacted wisdom teeth on the top. Te Both my wisdom teeth were impacted, but I, the first time on the lower half they, they were removed, I had a bad experience. Uh, I think the guy actually 
gave me too much anesthesia and I died actually. I really think I, I like, oh my God. yeah, like I, I was like flatlined, I think. And, and it's in a dentist office or whatever. So they don't have anything on you, you know? And oh my God. Uh, yeah, cause I had really bad reaction afterwards. And I was like, mom. And my, my mother was like, you didn't come out of it for a while. And I didn't think you were breathing. I'm like, it probably wasn't. Oh my God. <laughs> no. So I never, I would never go and have the top ones. And I had them taken out last year. But I have like a lot of tension and pain right through here. And it's, and, and I'm like, you know, I, I am on a computer a lot, but I'm like, what? and I do breathing exercises, do all this stuff. And I still can't, like, my eyes are sore. I'm like, what the heck is going on with this? And I got to find, like, something to, like, cure me. <laughs> so what's really interesting about that is um, our mouth and our tongue and our teeth have a lot of real estate in our brain. So, yeah. Um, when we get in, uh, I mean, threatening situation is kind of the language we use. Um, situations with a lot of threat, right? Uh, something that's really dangerous to us. Our past experience can dictate that. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of things can dictate that. But any work on our mouth, a lot of dental work can cause you a lot of threat, right? It's just, even yeah. if you're under, it's, it's a scary experience. That will heighten sympathetic tone. Yeah. Um, and what... And, and, and it'll cause a lot of pain, especially because the mouth has so much real estate in the brain. So for someone like you, I would work on, um, I mean, I, I have tools that ha like there, I've got vibrating tools that you can bite on or like put on the inside of your cheek and to stimulate that area yeah. and you do performance, like enhancing drills, like drills that will, that are really good for you. And I, and I help figure those out at oh, the same wow. time that the mouth is stimulated. Yeah. And a lot of times you get a really good result from that, but you just have to train the activation at your mouth um, in doing other things. But it's, that's a super common thing, right? Our, our mouth has so much real yeah. estate in our brain. There's so much sensory information oh, from our mouth. Yeah, it's all through here. I, I mean, when I was going to the, for, for my doctor, you know, she, she's thinking it's allergies and I'm like, maybe that is aggravating a little bit, but I'm like, it's the palate behind the eyes. And, and I'm like, I, I just don't even know what to do with it. And, and it's, it's the craziest thing. And when you say that, I'm like, Oh my God, that sounds so good. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. And, it, and the best part about it is that it makes sense, right? Um, yeah, well, we, our like range of motion, our, uh, our, uh, our, pain it's all dictated by like i mean our brain just wants us to be safe right if we feel unsafe in certain positions we're going to stay out of those positions our body's going to say nope my range of motion stops here yeah. because i don't feel safe going all the way back here even if it's not a real threat yeah. our mouth i mean you had a traumatic experience uh any dental work is can be very traumatic especially if you're yeah. ripping it out um but especially yours um our our body will have a pain response um mm -hmm. to keep you away from touching your mouth right it doesn't want anybody touching your mouth yeah. but it, but what the cool stuff and the stuff that i'm really interested in is how um some of this stuff causes depression or anxiety or um adhd because i mean how, do, how does our brain keep us safe we might have uh purely physical problems yeah. or vestibular problems those are our balance problems and uh we, they're, they're so bad that our body says, nope, you're not going to face the world today. I'm going to have you lay down all day. I'm going to have you be tired all day because yeah. that's a lot less threatening than going to work and dealing with people and having relationships. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to hide under my blankets because that's our brain keeping us safe. Wow. So you rehab wow. some of those mechanisms and uh, you, I mean, all of a sudden you're not quite as depressed. You get those neurotransmitters firing a little bit better. Yeah. So yeah. when when you were when you were doing your fight training, this this interest sparked you because you 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 noticed a difference when you were fight training. You you weren't having pain. Yeah. So I mean, it was it the only so much time fun. of day I would be training wow. for like when I started. I would be training for like hours a day. Like I I would probably train like four hours a day. Sometimes six hours a day. Like I was training all the time because that was the only time of day where I didn't have any pain. What I learned afterwards, I, I, I mean, I'd go home and then I'd be in pain again, yeah. but then I, I would just go back the next day to be out of pain. Those were my hours that, without pain a little bit afterwards too. Um, I didn't realize this when I was doing this, huh. but what happens is um, we have 
different receptors in our body, um, some of which are nociceptors, which is our kind of our, our pain receptors. Mm -hmm. And those move very slowly, right? From our, a point in our body to our brain, they move very slowly up the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. um, and mechanoreceptors, which are our movement receptors, they, those fire really quickly. So uh, when you're fighting, when you're moving, those can override those nociceptors because those are getting to your brain before the, the nociception signals are getting there. Um, that's why when you burn your hands, you might wave it around, right? It's on fire, like it, it hurts, you, you wave it around because uh, that's mechanoreception overriding the nociception. Sometimes it doesn't always work, but uh, that's, that's the idea. I had no idea I was doing it. I just knew it felt right and it felt better than just laying down and sitting there and just being overwhelmed by nociception. Right. Wow. That's so interesting. Cause I do notice that too. If I'm out doing something, I tend to feel a little bit better. I mean, I still feel it, but it tends not to be as bad. But when I'm at home, I really like, it's cause you can focus on it. You got nothing distracting you maybe. <laughs> I don't know. And, yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's just, you're not moving, right? Your yeah. nociception overrides all like there's a, you're, you've got a lot of receptors, right? You're, you've yeah. got your, like heat receptors, your balance, uh, your mechanical receptors, you've got everything working and that kind of keeps that, those pain receptors because they're very slow. They're mm -hmm. very slow. Those keeps them kind of at bay. Mm -hmm. um, but when you stop moving, when you stop participating in your day, then all of a sudden those nociceptors, I mean, they're still there. They're, they're fighters. They don't, they don't go away. They're, they're always there. Yeah. And those kind of take over. So, um, you you also i'm just gonna go into you you help people you, you actually train people with parkinson's yeah teach them boxing now yeah. does the coaching go into that too as well yeah so i this is so the program yeah so i was totally lucky that i found it and i and i can't believe that i i can't believe i found it actually my mom was uh she's a nurse practitioner and she was telling me how she has a friend in Boston who is starting a boxing for Parkinson's yeah. program in Boston. And I was like, are you serious? That is so up my alley. It's neuroscience. It's fighting. It's, you know, it's, it's everything that I love. Why, like, why did I just have to move to New York? Like, I would get behind that immediately. Yeah. But then I thought, well, I'm in New York City. There is... Uh, I mean, there's definitely something, there's everything in New York City. I'm sure they have something out here. Yeah. And I Googled it and found it and got in touch with the, the owner of um, this program called Stop PD. Mm -hmm. And I immediately uh, had a meeting with him, told him about my background. And he said, you know, honestly, if, if you really are interested, I mean, you're very qualified to do this. I mean you can start taking classes pretty soon. Just, just observe it for a little while. We'll teach a couple of classes together, but then you can go off and do your own thing. And um, I started picking up a couple more classes and it's great. So I, I get to use a lot of what I, I did for um, my athletes before mm -hmm. on Parkinson's. So I don't have a background in Parkinson's. I, I, I didn't really understand the disease that well, but mm -hmm. what's cool about um, the functional neurology is that you can kind of poke and prod um, without, I mean, pretty safely, right? And every person's different. And there are going to be some trends in uh, Parkinson's patients. They've got some, some things that are very similar to each other. So uh, certain eye movements, I've looked up and I've talked to people that, that I use specifically for the Parkinson's patients. But I still do all my other stuff because everybody's different. Everybody has different threatening ranges of motion. Everybody has different movements that they need to get better at or will help them feel better. So I, I do the Parkinson's, uh, the very specific Parkinson's drills with them. But then I do stuff that I do with, uh, that I've worked with professional athletes. Wow. I mean, like I, I do some of that stuff too. And some of them respond really well. Yeah. Some of them will come up to me and say that uh, their tremors uh, wow. have been have gotten so much better or they they feel better afterwards they're happier afterwards and that's one of the biggest things i learned through the neuroperformance stuff is that uh which took a while for me to understand or accept at least is that when you get out of a workout you're not supposed to feel horrible 
if you leave your workout and you feel like you were run over by a truck, which is what I would do all the time. And like, that's how I knew I worked hard. Yeah. Uh, you're not doing it right because then your posture is in a threatened height, like in a, a, a really threatened state, right? You've got all this sympathetic tone. You leave like that. Then you take so many steps in a day and gravity just pounds this posture into you. And, uh, that stays with you into your next training. So the idea is to work and train hard mm -hmm. and then you do these drills to bring your posture back up. Um, like feel less pain, feel less threat. So you leave and, you're, you, can still move and you can still uh, function, right? I would leave training and I would just be like rolling into my car on my way home. I, I can remember too being like my, my joints being so achy and then you'd come home and you just flop on the couch afterwards and you can't do anything. Like just my neck, my, my wrist, my knees, you know, anything that was attacked during like a uh, feeling horrible yeah exactly and and that's what a lot of a lot of the proprioceptive stuff that I do and and it's stuff that I'm uh I'm very uh careful about doing on myself and I'm I'm very I uh do it all the time is uh opening up those joints right getting a full range of motion I go through any one thing about jiu-jitsu that's really great is I'm very aware of each of my joints because I yeah. have been tapped <laughs> with every one of my joints so I'm very aware to go through all of them and open them up and make sure that they are not jammed because jam joints uh, will cause pain, will cause weakness, um, and I open up all of them. So I mean, and that's that's half of what I do to to open myself up, and make sure I don't leave in pain, mm -hmm. don't leave in a threatened state. Mm -hmm. So there's specific exercises that you do. Are they kind of uh, yoga based or? Uh, like typical yoga moves or are they, they different? Uh, more They're like different. So yoga's great. Um, sorry, my, my phone's getting all funny. Um, yoga's great uh, and to a point, right? And it's, and it's the same with every specialized sport. And what people who specialize in sports really need to be careful of. Um, a lot of movement, movements that you do in yoga can be very linear. Um, which is very like forward backwards mm -hmm. movement, um, which is great if you have trouble with that. But if you only do forward backwards, the only thing you're going to get good at is forward backwards, and then uh, you're, that's not a full range of motion. Um, for me, I before I did martial arts, I played hockey, I played soccer, I played lacrosse. That is very linear as well, right? I'm running, and I'm running a straight line. Mm -hmm. Or even if I even if I change direction, my leg never got up to the side like it does now. When I when I first learned how to kick, it was like it was mind blowing because my leg had never been sideways before. Like it had never been like in a like a roundhouse kick position, like like a fighter or a dancer would do. Yeah. Um, so for me, that's very therapeutic because uh, the better range of motion I have, the more. The, the safer I feel in space. So I had to learn. So uh, martial arts for me was really good rehab because it got my leg moving in a full range of motion. Um, yoga does that in certain ranges of motion, but when you get really tied down to proper technique and doing the same thing over and over again, you start to lose some of that range of motion because you're so precise. And the same thing with martial arts, the better you get, the more precise your movements are. So your range of motion actually gets smaller uh, because you're hitting your jab the same way. Right. You're kicking the same way. It's not as wide. Of, like you don't have as much movement freedom as you think uh, when you first start, right? It's, it's yeah. they're very precise movements. And so you need to be really careful not to fall into that trap and to make sure you constantly check your other range of motion that you might not be using. Right. Right. Wow. And it, it doesn't look like, it doesn't look like stretching. It's not like stretching. Um, it's, it's more, uh, move it. It's, it's more being able to move, uh, isolate a joint and move it in a full circle or figure eight, um, in, in the wide, in, the widest you can yeah it's not it's like, not just getting there and stretching it as far as you can yeah so a lot, I, there's a lot of circular 
explosion. Did that complex? It, uh, it's it, it's actually harder for a lot of us. And, I, and every time I get to a range of motion where it's a little bit harder to uh, navigate, right? Sometimes we get this amnesia in certain positions. And I, we've all felt it when we're like lifting or stretching. You, you feel like, or, or when we learn a new movement. Like uh, I felt it all the time when I was learning Muay Thai. You learn a new movement. You're like, wait, my leg has never been here before. What it like, I can't even feel my arm right now. Like, where is it? And you have to learn to know where it is because it's threatening not to know where your limbs are. Right now, I don't know what's going on, but the audio is really like clicking. So um, it just stopped. So I'm not sure why it was doing that. I can move to uh, my iPad. You want to know that? See, like right now it sounds fine. So I don't know what was happening. Do you have like a microphone stuck in your phone? Mm, no. Okay. All right. I because sometimes that will do that. Now, now it sounds fine. So I can turn off my Wi-Fi too because I did hear some of the clicking. Yeah. Now it's fine. It, it just you were given such a great thing. I didn't want to interrupt, but like it was it was clicking so bad, and I was like, "What is going on?" And and I don't know if it was. <laughs> oh, see, it just started doing it again. So I don't know. Oh, it's I think it's oh, so. I'm plugged into my. Um, I'm plugged in, and it keeps saying that it's not uh, supported by this. This device doesn't support it. So I'll, I'll just unplug. Okay. Maybe. okay. Is it better right now. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. I know you were giving such a good talk on the yoga, the differences between like what, what the range of motion is and stuff like that. And that doesn't make sense. I mean, you're on a mat, you know, and you, you can only do so much. I mean, you get your twists in, but you aren't doing the full circular motion, say in the shoulders, your shoulder girdle or, or even hips. Yeah. And anything, anything that's very, I mean, there's a way to do it. There's technique to it. Yeah. You're supposed to go. I mean, it's not giving you the freedom to, Explore, yeah, explore your full range of motion, and that's and so. But for someone who doesn't do yoga, mm. where yoga is a really novel stimulus to them, mm. yoga will be really beneficial to them. Right. So they can train those uh, those ranges of motion that they're not comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And but the problem is, once you get really good at it, mm. uh, you know, you you need to expand that and make sure you're you're testing you're testing those areas that you're not reaching through yoga. Mm. But but it's mostly the the linear aspect of it is is where it can be where it lacks neural uh, activation right it's more circular motions uh, more novel motions are uh, better for neural activation. Wow, such a cool, interesting field, and it's not something that I've actually re really heard too much about before. So I was kind of like really intrigued when you had mentioned. It. I was like, "Oh, this sounds really neat." We have so many new modalities coming out for to help people with pain that aren't um, mid like you know popping pills. You know, there's so yeah. Much and you know what? That's and that's exactly why it's. Yeah, that's exactly why it's happening is because of like the opioid epidemic yeah. and there needs something, something needs to happen. And I love that it's coming from science. It's coming from the fitness industry. It's coming from new forms of, I mean, modalities and because they're in, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to become a doctor. I was um, do that. So is that what sparked becoming a physician? You're in pre-med now, right? Yeah. So with my experience with doctors was horrible and I, I was in so much pain and I mean, everybody knows how hard it is to book appointments. Then they shuttle you around to different doctors. And here, take um, a pill. <laughs> and here, take a pill. And, it, and the thing is, nothing would ever really get better. And when you're in pain, you're also, the, you, you also get weakness, right? Pain, pain is uh, very related to weakness. And um, I'm, I'm an athlete and my performance matters a lot to me and I, I, I'm not going to accept that. And so I sort of, I, I, I have a lot of friends in, um, uh, 
with holistic medicine and I, and I love it and I talk and I talk to them about it. I'm really interested in the science behind it, why it works. Um, but I also think that holistic medicine is lacking a little bit too. So my, my motivation for going into medicine is sort of to fuse the two. Um, I'd love to go into neurology and I'd love to go into pain management because, yeah. um, I mean, the, the pill thing is just out of control. Yeah, it's uh, huge. I had a grandmother who was 97 who was popping all kinds of pain medication, and she never really truly got relief. She would have me taking her to different doctors for pain, and, and it would alleviate a little bit for a little while, and then she would just be like, no, it's not working anymore, and she would be in agony. And I'm like, God, I don't want to be that way if I live that long. You know, yeah. like, no, yeah. you know no relief no relief, can't sleep at night, can't, you know, like, and I'm like, you know, I know you have to stay moving. You do definitely, yeah. that's one thing, but um, to have uh, physicians or a, a medical community who, who utilizes alternative medicine too, and believes in that, that, that the body is very capable of healing itself mm -hmm. uh, is, is huge. And we do need more physicians that, that will bridge that gap and bring say Eastern medicine and mix the Western medicine together. Yeah, and I think that's happening um, I, more and more. Um, but I think the, the saddest part for me is, I mean, I hear people all the time say, like, oh, I'm in pain, or like, I've got back pain. Yeah. Because I'm, oh, that's because I'm old. Like, everybody has back pain when I'm old. And it's like, wait, so it's just downhill from here? Like, that is, <laughs> that is the saddest thing. No kidding. Like, I've ever heard it. it's like, what, are you kidding me? It's just like you get worse and worse every day yeah. and you just accept it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to accept that at all. So no. uh, that's the motivation behind it. I'm not, I'm not going to, every day I, I want to get better. I'm not, I don't want to get worse, you know? Yeah, so. I hear you. So it's pretty exciting. You, you've bridged this gap between fighting and then you're, you're in medicine now. So you'll be a, you know, you can kick somebody's ass yeah and 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 you know maim them and then heal them <laughs> you know i only if on, only if i like them <laughs> <laughs> yeah no I, it'll be it'll be interesting um and the fun thing is about it in that i'm i'm in a pre-med program um i'm interested in osteopathic medicine uh right now but every day and when i started this i I wasn't even positive that medicine is where I wanted to go. I just knew I needed an education um, in the sciences. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do chiropractics. I didn't know if I wanted to do osteopathic medicine. I didn't know if I wanted to do regular medicine um, or, or even, uh, you know, what specialty I wanted to do. I just wanted to get close to the science. Um, I mean, obviously network. I'm in New York. I'm meeting yeah, so many right? people. I'm in, I'm in this Parkinson's program. I never expected to be do, like doing this when I signed up and uh, every, and, and I'm fighting. And so everybody that I meet, all the things that I do is kind of shaping what kind of practice I want to have or what I want to be. And, and that's still unclear. Like me, I, I still have uh, a couple years before I can go to med school and so much can change in a couple years. So that, I mean, I might do something completely different, but I know that that's my trajectory right now, mm -hmm. and um, I'm really excited about it, mm -hmm. and it, for me, they're one and the same. Fighting is part of my uh, medical journey. Yes. Learning, learning about your body. I know so much more about the human body than so many of my classmates, even people who are in, uh, I mean body work careers, I know so much more about my body than, the, I mean, they might be able to name some stuff, but I have moved in every which way and I've pushed my body to these yeah. extremes. Yeah, that, because uh, of jujitsu, right? Because of jujitsu and your fight training, because you are going to extremes. That's, that's the great thing about an athlete. That's why I think athletes are so fascinating because they, they're willing to push their body to those extremes to discover and, and, and to see how far can we push the human body. Yeah. They help. Yeah. And, that's, and that's something you can't teach in school. That's not no. something that you read in a book. Understanding what happens to your muscles when you are physically exhausted. Yeah. You can't, you can't know what that is until you've done it. You don't, I mean, you can't, 
I mean, going through these weight cuts are just, you understand chemical energy right. so much more. I mean, you appreciate it so much more. Like what sugar does to you? What carbs do to you? What fat does to you? What protein does to you? I mean, you watch your body transform yeah. and then transform back like constantly. Yeah. And you understand what everything you put in your body is doing to you. And maybe not by name, not chemically, uh -huh. but you, you know what it feels like and yeah. you can't teach that you, you have to experience that. And, uh, so my, I mean, my medical journey is very tied to what, what I'm doing with my fighting. Yeah. Does it make it easier? Like when you're in class and you like the, the instructor there is, is saying something you're like, Oh, I totally get it because I just did that back at the, you know, like our, or whatever your food preparation or whatever. And you're like, I'm starving and I can feel the chemical reactions in my body because of this, that, or the other thing or whatever. You must yeah. know that, right? Well, sometimes. So since <laughs> I'm, I'm starting from like very basic chemistry, uh -huh. which I've, I've never taken chemistry before. I'm starting from very basic chemistry. I'm doing bio right now, which is a little bit better. Like I know a lot, all the neuro stuff, yeah. um, which is great. Um, and I, and I know, uh, b basic organ system stuff. Um, but the, what it's helpful for is it's, what's helpful for is that I have a context. Like I read, I read on my own, a lot of nutrition stuff that I do, I read on my own and they say these words and I mean, I think most people can relate when they read nutrition stuff and they say these words that are just kind of weird. You, you just sort of accept them as words. Like what the hell is a protein? What the hell is a carbohydrate? Like what, what the hell is this? They're just words. Mm -hmm. um, now I, I understand in my classes, like, oh, what it actually means structurally. Mm -hmm. And it keeps me interested. I think that's the biggest, that, that's the biggest thing. It's that, oh, I actually have an example. I have a context mm -hmm. where I know what this is. Sometimes it's easy, like for me, it's really easy to get lost in chemistry when there's no context. It's just like they're talking about these invisible dots that apparently make up everything. And I, I don't care about that. I care about like what's actually, what exists and what I deal with on a daily basis. So, so the nutrition stuff that I, that I uh, have been studying, I mean, that on my own is, uh, it's, it's a good context for learning the chemistry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so cool. I mean, like, I, I just think it's really fascinating that you're in the fight field and then you're going for your, you know, you're going into medicine or some form to help people and, and then want to put together a program that is within movement and what you're learning is and, and base it, you know, use martial arts as kind of a tool to, which I think beyond yoga, martial arts, um, you know, I, I used to always think that, um, Yoga, you're on your mat, it's internal, and then martial arts takes what's internal and puts it external, and you, you take that practice that might have been internal and you take it more like you inter interact on a, on, a mat, on a bigger mat with other mm -hmm. people. So they have similar kind of things, but you're t instead of being isolated on your mat like a monk or something like that, you're now going into the world and, and using your practice. So taking that even to help heal people or um, you know, um, help people that have disabilities or whatever, I think is a really cool, and I think they would like that. I think people- It's more fun, right? It's yeah. so much more fun so to move. More fun. I mean, nobody wants to go to PT. I don't think, you know, like, you know, like, and, and sit there and like, oh, I got to be on a machine and like, you know, do whatever, do resistant bands work or something. I mean, I didn't like doing it, you know, for injuries or whatever. I would rather like, okay, show me this, that, or the other thing, some full range motion and make it a little bit kind of interesting, fun where you're stimulating the mind too, right? Yeah. And I mean, you can't, sim you can't heal your body without healing your brain too. Yeah. So you can, I mean, things can go back in. I mean, it happens all the time. People get injured and the, structurally they're healed, but they're still in pain. Yeah. I mean, they, there's a, there's a huge threat response, right? You, yes. you tear your ACL yeah. or you tear something in your shoulder. Um, yeah. You do all your rehab, everything yeah. is structurally put back together. There's still pain there. There's still weak change there. Thing in your mind. And you, yeah, and you, and you, and you say to yourself, oh, well, it's because I had this surgery. It's a little weaker. Yeah. It's no, it's just that you haven't rewired your brain to make it feel safe. Yeah. Right. If you're scared that you're going to tear it again, it's, you, you're not, your body's not going to let you 
lift as much or throw as much. Yeah. And uh, it's amazing to me, actually, it's amazing to me that medicine, people can do so much body work and like rehab and, uh, and, and even medicine without actually moving anything. I don't know. It's just there. I just, I just see movement and medicine to be such a similar thing mm -hmm. that it's amazing to me how rarely they're put together. It's yeah. like the fitness industry and then there's the medical field and there's just, how are they not overlapping more? Right. And the, you know, the reason is that when they try to make medical school or um, everything to get up to medical school so hard, they try to get people to uh, only focus on what they're studying and they're not actually focused on all the other things. They're not, there's, there's no time to train. There's no time to be a fighter. There's yeah. no time, whatever you need yeah. to, you need to learn about your body in the books. Right. No, you need to learn your about your body in space, space. in in life, in movement. You need that's how you learn about your body. Well, Going to be the best physicians, I think, because they understand the human body much better. It's like uh, they used to use artists. You know, um, artists would paint or draw the body, and they knew the anatomy and physiology better than the physicians did because yeah. they actually had the hands on and were like looking and then drawing like say you know your your the deltoid or whatever or, you know like and they were like looking at these muscles and actually knew how they shaped how they connected the insertion points all that but i wanted to get back to you started to talk about like you know neural the neuro pain like I don't know if you watched the fights this weekend, but um, yeah. Tanya Tanya Evinger was fighting, and I I I know you know she lost, but um, I reached out to her and I was concerned because of the way she went down, and she just came off of a major major surgery on her knee and leg and like a lot of pain, and my feeling was that you know, could she have been, and I, I haven't, you know, I'd love to question her on it, have her back on the show and have her talk about this. But um, I wondered if during the fight when she went down, because she went down awkwardly, if she was worried about her leg and then just could have had a, a flash, a shock of fear, of pain, like not, not wanting to feel that again and protecting herself and then just not really performing at her previous, like pre-injury, the way she'd perform. I well, what I would expect, with her. yeah, well, what I would expect, um, because of the, the, I mean, the, the adrenaline of the situation, I doubt that it was, uh, I doubt that it would be an immediate shock of pain, which it very well could have been, but I think more likely, um, I mean, there's a lot of unconscious things that our brain does to I shut mean. down the function of your, of your knee. And even if she wasn't aware of it a lot, I mean, you're, the way you're you commit especially in fighting the way you commit to a punch or the commit to the full like uh rotation of your body is very limited if you have a past injury you're not going to rotate your, if you can't rotate your knee yeah. you can't throw your punch as powerfully as you can i mean you you're holding back and yeah. if you're gonna fall yeah. and and i and i have a uh, i just recently sort of hurt my knee a little bit and I'm very careful to before every training. I I do knee circles. Yeah. I, I get my full range of motion because I know that if I plant on my knee before doing those knee circles, it's going to freeze. And we've all done that, right? We we plant really far and we feel our knee buckle or or something like that. Yeah. But our 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 brain, I mean, it it's got a lot of protective mechanisms. And I and I agree. I'm sure that power and uh, her reaction. Uh, so I, I didn't actually see that fight, but I, I, it was one of the first or second fights on the, the pre, uh, you know, the <laughs> preliminaries. Yeah. And, and she, she went down awkwardly, I thought. And, um, and then she just, she really didn't come, come back. And I, I couldn't help but think that something just, you know, and maybe unconsciously, but it, it didn't, to me look like her typical way of being and and it's the first time she's been back in the cage since that injury and i was like oh man because i know like for me i have a i have a knee uh, an acl tear that i've i've injured and injured and injured and still have not had surgery but it was only like a partial tear so it's yeah. just a non-functioning one and um I I've injured it three times and I still like my, my knee will buckle every now and then it'll surprise me. And I'm like, geez. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? And you know what? That's scary. Yeah. And 
I bet your power and speed decrease after oh, the buckle. Absolutely. Right? And, and that might feel a little bit more conscious, right? You're yeah. be like, oh, I got to be careful. And, that's, and that is a conscious adjustment. But even if you weren't aware of it, I, I would guarantee that your power and your speed yeah. are compromised yeah. when you feel that buckle. Because yeah. that's a threat response, yeah. right? That's oh, wow. highly threatening. You've had something traumatic happen to a body part. Yeah, and, and then you it, hold back. You, I mean, I, I've, I've held back on any sort of, um, you know, I, I never, I didn't tr train to fight anymore after that. Like, I, 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 I wouldn't do that because I was worried that I would tweak it somehow, twist it in some weird way that I would really injure myself and I'd be put out and I wouldn't be able to work maybe, you know? Yeah. And, yeah, so you just start thinking these silly things. But, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I, I think it's a, it's a, big part of of the game if say a fighter is injured and they've had some major injury that they're not going to perform completely unless they take care of those other sorts of things especially if they've had a you know a good recovery with surgery but their their brains maybe are gonna yeah you know and, it, and it's crazy in in the fight world it's insane because you get yeah. so much just straight uh like Con like concussive yes yeah uh, <laughs> you know action up there it's yeah. like you you're getting you're you're getting your brain rattled and in a lot of other sports you might have body parts that ha that are injured but when you you're getting like hit directly in in the head yeah. there's a lot of stuff that happens and that and, and the biggest one that i see is the vestibular um with fighters you you there's a fighter posture Mm -hmm. And vestibular is your balance. It's how you are, like, mm -hmm. what is straight up, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so many people, you'll see head tilts. You'll see yeah. sort of a bobbly head when they walk. Yeah. Or the opposite happens. You see people with really stiff necks. Yeah. Because they are, their vestibular system, their, their inner ear is all, is, is a little bit lopsided. Yeah. You don't know where the ground is. Huh. So your neck gets frozen yeah. into in the space. And, <sighs> Wow. Oh, You're walking. Your whole body is just saying, don't fall over. Don't fall over. I don't know where the ground is because yeah. normally they would have a head tilt or there is something about their balance is off. And, yeah. and you see it in, I see it in grapplers all the time. They're actually, you know, all, everybody, all, all the fighting, uh, a lot, all the fighters, it's, it's this very stiff, uh, PMRF posture. It's a, it's, uh, it, and, it, and that's vestibular, that's balance oriented. And we don't really think about balance in our daily life because like I can get around, right? I don't fall over. Yeah. But the thing is, it's there, there's a, a, a quieter um, balance issue that's going on in my head. And I, I have to address yeah. that in order for me to generate the power that I want to power that I, that I want to, um, or that I, if I want to move as well as I want to, to get out of pain, I, it's, yeah. it's really common in the fight community. Yeah, I could definitely see that. I know like um, years ago I had a, um, uh, from a, one, a, a 200 pound guy kind of um, leaning on me. We, it was, he was going light. He didn't, you know, it wasn't intentional or anything, but I pushed my hand to push him off of me, like doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or whatever. I was like, I don't know, I was in side control. He, he had side control on me and I was on my side and I went to push him up and I tweaked my shoulder, but then somehow it, affected my neck maybe some of the muscles there mm -hmm. so i went i was down in florida i was in a lot of pain couldn't sleep at night so i went to an acupuncturist who was also a chiropractor and all i wanted was the acupuncture for the shoulder my neck wasn't bothering me it was here and um he adjusted me after the acupuncture and my neck has never like i i, I like it was to me so violent he like cracked it and I was like oh my god you should have yeah. told me gonna do that I would have relaxed you know like but um it never was the same I used to, like I never cracked my neck now I can you know crack my neck and I'm yeah. like and and so when you say that stuff I'm like oh god I probably have a little of that going on back there too that's affecting all through here you know most people have a little bit of dysfunction and yeah. it's and it's a function of I mean, even our eyes, we don't, we don't, getting a full range, our eyes and our vestibular are really connected. It's yeah. the vestibular ocular reflex, like that's vestibulo and ocular reflex. Yeah. And uh, our eyes, when do you use your full range of motion for your eyes? If I see something over like up there, 
like I'm going to move my head up there. So my eyes stay in the same spot, right? We never hold our eyes in this upward position. We never hold our eyes in this side position because we're always moving our head to compensate. And, and that's, uh, I mean, just like any other part of our bodies, our, our eyes are, uh, they need range of motion too. And yeah. as a result, you get a lot of people that don't even realize that they've got their, they don't, they don't even realize that they've got vestibular or visual problems. You know, it's, oh, no. uh, it's cool. It's cool. It's very cool. I can imagine like if they're, you know, if a guy gets knocked out, like, you know, jock, you know, knocked out that's got to affect all that if, if it happens several times you know like if, if mm -hmm. they knock out a lot or whatever that must long term oh of course and you get and you get people who say they'll get knocked out a bunch of times and they'll say they might have like a really like a recurring injury somewhere right they might have a, a, a bad knee or bad hips mm. they'll be like oh i'm like going i'm working on my hip because i like because they're so tight or like my knee because it's so tight mm -hmm. and it's like it's not your knee that needs work. It's your, your head that needs work, right? You, it's your, it's your, it's your vestibular that needs work. Your body is yeah. buckling and it's got all this pain and it's getting all these injuries. First of all, cause you're not moving right because your balance is off. Yeah. And second of all, it's in pain because it doesn't want you to move anymore. Cause every time you move, you get knocked out. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's, Hold that's totally back. fair. <laughs> It's all in back. That's pretty funny, but or yeah. you get fighters, they'll do that and they'll be tired all the time because their bodies like go to sleep because every time you leave the house, you get knocked out. Wow. And and that's totally. I mean, that's just common sense. Yeah. But it, it's it's our it's our it's our brain that's wow. doing. Like, it's not a willpower thing. It's your brain that's trying to protect you. Yeah. Uh, and it, and it and it's all connected. Yeah, totally, um, totally is. I, I mean, I, I often when I've worked with people, like they'll have like um, um, a pain in their their lower, like like in their right ankle or something, and I'll get a hit energetically, and I'm like, well, it's up here in your shoulder. We got to work. This is the hot spot, and I'm like, it's a kinetic, but it's a crossover polarity thing, and they're like, how did you do that? And I'm like, I don't know. It's just polarity. Like these things are connected somehow. There's some oh, yeah. going on in the body energetically. And then all these little neurons and who knows, I'm like my ankle don't hurt anymore. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's what in, oh, in yeah. medicine, like you get in, that's the confusing part, part about medicine. Cause you get special people who specialize in, I mean, they, yeah. they've got their specialties. Yeah. Um, and I'm in, a lot of times it's just so many different systems working together. Yeah. I mean, neurology is truly holistic, right? They, they, there's a Dr. Cobb who started the whole Z health program. Mm. He, he said that he's like, neurology is the most holistic, uh, field. And because that it's integrating everything that you do with your body, yeah. with your brain, right? Your brain is the, the one thing that everything has in common. You get, yeah. and you get, you go to a doctor cause your shoulder hurts and they're like, Oh, well there's nothing actually wrong with your shoulder. And then you go, maybe you should go to this doctor and then maybe you should go to this doctor. And, and it's, it, it's no, you, you need some, you need somebody like putting everything together. Like they, it's, yeah. it's great and all that. Yeah. They've separated everything the body. Together. Yeah. They've separated the body into all different compartments and you go see, like you said, different, different physicians for different things instead of seeing but someone that's treating the whole body and the whole person, you know, mind, body, spirit. And, and to me, that makes more sense with anybody because it's usually something, sometimes it's something emotional. Even. We, I mean, we're not even going to go there, but like it's, it's sometimes often people have emotional issues that are unresolved and that causes pain in their body. So yeah, yeah fascinating. So um, I like to get back to a little bit more about you, about like, you know, what your, what, what are personal habits or a daily routine that contributes to your your um, your success as as a you know a person out there. I mean, like you know, moving <laughs> that's forward, that's yeah, that's yeah, that's you're like kicking ass. I mean, you're going to you know pre med and you got you got a fight coming up and you're just I mean, you're living in New York. You're doing your thing. You're you're doing a lot of cool stuff. So what 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 keeps you going and moving? What what's well, my, my ADHD is a huge help with that. <laughs> it, it keeps me going from one, like it keeps me doing a lot of things. Um, but it's, but it's hard. So I, I have a really hard time. I've, it's, it's a weird thing. Like I'm a great multitasker and I'm a terrible multitasker. 
I'm really good at going from one thing to another and just like, I've got an idea and then I, and then I go like quickly go to another idea and then I go to another idea and I do all these things. I have all these great ideas, but the problem is, uh, sticking with multiple things, right? So it's, it's one thing to have a bunch of ideas, but it's, it's about having like doing multiple things at the same time, but con- like in continuing with something, following through with something. So that's, that's a struggle for me all the time. Yeah. Um, results and, and, and accomplishing something. Right. Yeah. And I, and I get lost with that all the time. And, uh, I, sometimes I go off on my tangents. I get really excited about one thing and I sort of leave the other one behind. Um, my parents are really good about that. They, they're, they're always there making me look at the big picture. Um, big picture is really important for me cause I'm very in the moment. That's, that's just sort of who I am. Um, but it's, it's about that autopilot that I'm talking about. And I, oh, I lost like, me. Did, did you? Yeah. Just, for Hello? A second. just, just, I'm there now. Can you see me or hear me? Yeah. I can see you. Okay, you can hear me. I just lost that. You said you were on autopilot, and then it went out. So I didn't want to miss what you said because I'm, I, this is probably going to help some people. Yeah. So I'm. I. Uh, it, it's about the autopilot, right? So I. I used to spend so much time uh, just like getting through the day, right? All the stuff that most people do, like just really easily, are really hard for me. Like just getting up and getting breakfast and packing my bag and cleaning things up and doing the dishes and all of that stuff is a huge energy expenditure for me. Right. I, I, I'll go and, uh, I'll, I'll go, I'll get really messy over periods of time or I'll like, I'll spend a long time in the morning getting ready because I'll think about one thing I need to do. And then I think about another thing to do before I finish that other thing. And then I'm always checking in my head. Did I do this? Did I do this? Do I do this? Just like redoing a, t- a checklist over and over again. Mm-hmm. So finally, what I decided to do was just establish a morning routine. Um, I'm not a morning person. I roll out of bed and I go straight to the bathroom, brush my teeth. Then I come out, I make my breakfast. Then I uh, heat up my, uh, my meal prep and I fill up my, my protein shaker. I pack my bag. Like I have this whole routine set up and it's like it's very, very specific. Because if there's any variation in it, it's a like I lose so much energy and I feel myself get exhausted by it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I I have all these things for cleaning in my room. Um, I have these buckets where I keep things because opening drawers is just too much energy, right? It's too that's two steps: opening, putting something away, closing it. Actually, that's three steps, right? I just want to if I if I get my laundry back, I throw it into where I need it to go. Mm-hmm. Um, I, it's about simplifying all those little things. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I have, then I have the energy to focus on the stuff that I really like. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my strengths, right? I have a lot of ideas. I have a lot of imagination. I have a lot of energy and passion for what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, if I'm worried about, uh, simple routine stuff, I can't focus on any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. I get like extreme anxiety from worrying about, what groceries do I need to get? Like writing lists. Like, am I forgetting something? Cause I'm always forgetting something. Am I late? I used to be late all the time. Now, I mean, now I'm late sometimes, but not as much because I have these routines set into place and uh, I just go by that. Yeah. You stick to them. Yeah. And without that, uh, I'm spending my whole day and I'm exhausted at the end of the day mm-hmm. doing little things that everybody does. Like, I don't know if everybody does and is inspired by that stuff exhausts me. Yeah. I I mean, do you prioritize, do you prioritize what you want to accomplish? I mean, you, you are in, you know, you're going to school, you're at Columbia. So you're, and plus you're, you're at, you know, so Gracie. So you got to be, you know, like set your schedule. Like you said, you, 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 um, you know, set up your week, for your your meals and stuff so you really have to focus in on putting some attention to that so do you prioritize things for yourself too school first school is definitely first yeah um, but the, the the thing that i know about myself is that i have enough energy to do school and for fighting when i get overwhelmed and i'm like oh i uh 
I, I need to cram for this exam. I know in my head that it, the reason I'm cramming is because I wasn't spreading out my studying the way I was supposed to, right? Um, I don't I don't usually like skip training to to study all night or whatever. I, I don't I don't usually. I mean, I've I pulled a couple late nights, but I, I don't do that. I used to do that all the time. I would be yeah. Now you don't. Night. You learned <laughs> last minute. But the thing is, if I if I honestly and like truly want to fight, I need to take care of myself better than that. I need to plan better than that. That's all on, on me. Right. Um, so, and there are some things that martial arts has taught me and uh, especially jujitsu. Mm -hmm. It's and the biggest thing is to show up, just mm -hmm. show up every day. Even if you don't want to, even if you don't think you're going to do anything, like you don't have enough energy to like actually learn anything. You don't want to be there. Just show mm -hmm. up and, and just do it because you're going to get, because one of those days you have like three bad days in a row, then you're going to get a good day. Right. And those are the good days that are going to really matter. And you know what? You're actually learning when you're on those bad days. I try to do that with school. Right. Um, I do a lot like in my, in my routines, like I'm in the train all the time. Uh -huh. um, I'm constantly listening to uh, lectures and things online. Like there's a, there's a great app. It's the, uh, the great courses app. They they have got courses and everything. And sometimes I don't even listen to the stuff I'm studying. I, I listen to um, other things. But that's a great way for me to not need to, like, I, I can multitask, right? It's in my ears. I'm listening to it. I'm hearing it. It's like learning a language right. where even if I'm not focused on it, I'm hearing these words over and over again. I'm more familiar with them. Um, and I'm just, I'm very careful to do a little bit every day. So I do a little bit of studying every day. I do a little bit of training every day. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's not like, uh, I'm not gonna get super smart in one night. I'm not going to get really good at fighting in one day, mm -hmm. right? I've gotta do it every day. Yeah. And it's about, it, like, again, about being on autopilot. I leave in the morning, I put my headphones in and I start listening and that's the start of my day. Um, and that's then, cool. so you, um, you, 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 you keep the same routines to be successful and, and to deal and to kind of combat your ADHD, mm -hmm. set those in, a, in place to, to combat that. That's, yeah, that's a lot. And, and did you feel like, you know, your martial arts kind of helped you to do that? Oh, hundred percent. So I, I've already told you about the pain, right? My pain is a lot better. Um, which is huge, which is a huge distraction, right? If you're in pain, you're going to be moving. You're going to be a wiggler. Like, uh, you're going to, you're, you're not going to be able to read. I had a really hard time reading because I was in pain. Um, I mean, more specifically with me, I, had a, I have a hard time converging my eyes and that's a common thing with ADHD. Uh, cause in order to read, you need to, you need to converge your eyes cause the, the letters are close to you right. and the musculature in my eyes would just get exhausted and that's a huge ADHD problem. Mm -hmm. Um, which means I would get exhausted when I read, mm -hmm. I would be bouncing all over the page because they weren't staying converged. Yeah. Right. And a lot And this, this will probably sound relatable to people who are non ADHD. This happens I, all the time. I, I feel like that happens to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's, it's because, I mean, there's musculature in your eyes and if you can't yeah. keep your eyes converged and focused on a target, yeah. It's exhausting. It's like doing squats. It's a, yeah. th and it's muscular. I, I, I'll, I'll find I'm reading something. All of a sudden, I'm like, yeah, you just fall over. Like, yeah, I, I just fall asleep, and I'm like, what the hell? And then I'm like, okay, I gotta get up and walk around, and then I'll come back and I'll start reading again. But I'm like, mm, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and 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 that's a that's a protective response. It's exhausting, and I, I would get my my neck pain flares up when I read a lot, yeah. and. And so that's part of my, I mean, part of my routine is a little bit of neuro rehab. It's about, um, I work on visual suppression and uh, wow. I've got some visual suppression issues and I work on my convergence and it helps train my reading. Um, but also I have found a lot of resources online to like, I watch a lot of videos about what I need to learn. I listen to a lot of stuff. Um, that's easier for me and less exhausting, right? The whole, the whole thing with me is to do the the most efficient uh, do everything as efficiently as possible i don't have any extra energy to waste yeah. i mean i i want to use my energy fighting and problem solving in school i don't want to waste energy retaining the information yeah i want yeah. I, that i that should just 
throw me some information over and over again. I'll, I'll retain it eventually. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to be exhausted by just converging my eyes and reading this long book that doesn't really mean that much to me. Um, isn't that well written and right. just using all of my brain power and my energy on reading comprehension. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. that's not worth my energy. Yeah. So it's about finding other things. Learn differently though, too. You know, like you probably learn better differently, but those are things that sound like I, I wouldn't want to do either. Like if, it, if something was written really bad and you're like, okay, I got to just memorize this. Uh, ugh, you know yeah. yeah and it's uh and it's effective for tests and it's yeah. one of and it's a huge criticism i have about the education system um and i mean don't get me started on the education yeah, no, system I don't. and i don't and, and you know what i don't even know how i'd reform it but uh it's yeah it, it like when you get older too and i again with my with my fighting School is a little bit different. It's not about getting the best grades. It's about learning this stuff because it, it's going to matter. And it's, it's like I need to know this because it's going to impact my life, my training, my career, um, and I want to know it. And so it's about finding strategies to actually learn the information and not just memorize and then cause a bunch of back pain and then I can't go train. And it's, that's not sustainable for me. Yeah, no, it, I don't think it would be for anybody. Yeah. Well, I don't know. You've got some, I mean, especially at Columbia, you get some people who, uh, they're just sadists or no, no, no. They're, they're masochists. They're masochists. Sorry. They, they, they like put the, they're, they're not sleeping. They're reading all the time. They're miserable all the time. I don't, I don't know. Red Bull. <laughs> I mean, mental, mental toughness. I mean, yeah. you gotta, gotta give them that. There's a, there's a place for that, but it's yeah. just, it's just not sustainable. And that's not a life I want to live yeah. um, for. Yeah, so. I, I couldn't do that either. Health-wise, it just wouldn't feel right after a, long, a, a certain period of time. It, it catches up with you. You know, you go like say five, seven years of that kind of lifestyle, and it's like, oh God, what do you look like? You know, and how? Yeah. how What's you know, your attitude like? What are your relationships what's like? The toll it takes on your body. You know that you might not even see externally, but internally. You know, like. What's what's happening with your organs? What's happening with your your you know your fascia, your tissue, your muscles, your you know whatever your digestive system? You know, yeah. so that's 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 a huge concern, especially. But what's mind blowing? Well, what's mind blowing about that is that we expect kids to do this. Like you, yeah. you and I can be like, oh, that's it's still at that desk. It. But then you have a kid who's in school from like eight in the morning to like three in the afternoon. Yes. And I mean, most adults, and, and it's most, it's, uh, I'm most aware of this when I do these seminars, these neuro seminars, because they're from nine in the morning to six at night. Mm. I guess that's a little bit longer than a school day. Mm. But within the first couple hours, you see like all these adults like keeling over and like wow. exhausted and in yeah. pain, and just listening. And it's like, you, you yell at kids for like wiggling around in school or not paying attention in school and you can't even do this. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just mind blowing to me. And it makes me really mad because yeah. when I was a kid and I didn't feel like I was like doing as well as I should, or I would get in trouble for like not doing enough homework or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it makes me mad looking back on it because most adults can't do it. Right. Uh, yeah, nobody can. Nobody really can. It's, it's ridiculous. I, I, I mean, when I was in school, we had recess several times you know, throughout the day. And we had a nice long one, you know, midday or whatever, like around lunchtime. But we always, you know, we got a break. We could get out and we could stretch our legs. We'd get outside, get some fresh air. Now kids, they, they don't let them do any of that. I'm like, really? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I, it really is nuts. And it, and it just puts such a, an emotional toll on them. They don't think they're good yeah. enough because they can't sit in a room for like... Right. I don't know, however long, yeah, six yeah. hours and retain yeah. information. Nobody can do that. Adults can't do it. No. So can you give me um, uh, a, a, time or a story on your journey in your martial arts career where you experienced an aha moment of realization? Um, so, okay. So my aha moment, mm -hmm. um, I, I think what I was after school so okay so when I started fighting I was I uh when I started fighting I I, I talked about my background a little bit um mm -hmm. how I was in pain and that was the only thing that got me out of pain um I graduated from college uh, 
I had done this martial arts stuff a little bit here and there. Um, and uh, after school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was a really hard time in my life because I'm looking around at people and everybody's getting jobs. Everybody's going to school. And I'm like, I can't even sit at a desk because my neck hurts so much. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's moving out and I'm like moving back in with my parents. And uh, it's, you like, like you were failing. I felt oh, like a hundred percent. I I had no idea even where to start. I had, like I mean I would write cover letters and uh, resumes, and I, I would send them into jobs that I didn't even really want, and uh, I like nothing was sticking, and I I just didn't know what to do, and I and I and I couldn't fully commit to anything because again I, I mean I that's that's a big thing for me. I once you get me committed to something, I will not stop until like I will like run people over to get what I want and like I will I will put everything into it but if I'm not really passionate about something it's really hard for me to latch on to it and I that's what I found when I graduated from school I, I wasn't really qualified to do anything I didn't really know what I wanted to do um, the only thing I knew was that I was in pain and I wanted to get out of pain and I like to fight like I I'd done these like uh, I've done a, a little bit of jujitsu and I, uh, I've done a little bit of kickboxing and I was like, this is fun. I'm out of pain when I do this and I feel good about myself for some reason. Like I, I wasn't making any money from it. I wasn't like, it wasn't like productive, whatever. I mean, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, for some reason I felt like I, I liked this and it was right. Mm -hmm. And that's when I went into Connors and I, I, I said to the coach, I, I said to John, I said, uh, I want to fight. And six months later I had my first fight. And I mean, it, it was really fast and really sudden. And I, and I threw myself into it. Like I was training for hours, hours a day. And I, I didn't know why. And that's where most of my energy was going. Yeah. Um, but it just felt Good. right. And, uh, I don't know. I, I think that my aha moment was that I was doing the right thing. Even while I was doing all of this fighting, I, I was like, this isn't the right thing. I'm supposed to be doing something else. I'm supposed, I'm supposed to be like, I sh I'm supposed to have this like job. I'm supposed to have this like career path. And I was working. I, I had all these odd jobs and stuff. And then finally I woke up and I was like, I, I like medicine. I, I, I love my body. Like I love all the things it can do. I want to be able to help other people do that. And I think that was, and, and that was my big aha moment, not because it's, I, because I, I knew what I wanted to do, but I knew that everything that I had been doing was leading me there and everything that I had been doing was worthwhile. And, uh, again, you just show up to the gym every single day and you have no idea why. Mm -hmm. And then one day you wake up and you're like, oh, I know why. I know why because I'm supposed to be working with bodies. I'm supposed to be helping people. I'm supposed to be understanding how I work so I can help other people understand how they work. Wow. And, uh, that was, and that was my huge aha moment. And it actually like, it helped focus my training a little bit mm -hmm. because, I mean, I was going in and going into the cage and brawling. And that's, and that's scary. And it's kind of, it's even scarier when you don't know why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. But like now when I think about fighting, the whole goal of my fighting is because I am a biological masterpiece, right? I'm perfecting my body. I am moving in the most efficient way possible. And it's, I'm, I'm doing it for a purpose. I'm doing it to become the best doctor possible, right? I'm doing it to be a, a performance coach because if I can't do it and if I can't understand it, um, I'm not going to be able to help the people around me. And you know what? I may never be the best in the world at it, but I'm going to do everything I can to get there. and I'm going to get as close as possible. Um, and that was, I mean, that I think was my aha moment is that everything I was doing before was worthwhile. And it's that, the, the medicine and the fighting are fused together. They're, they're a single entity. They're, they're not two different things that I do. They're kind of one thing that I do. 
and uh, I, I've got to keep using, like, working with that as I go forward. Awesome. Wow. That's just, I, I love how you said you're, you're a biological masterpiece. Yes. I am. <laughs> Hard on this thing. That. that is so awesome. Yeah. And it might not be like perfect yet, but you know what? It's a work in progress. Yeah, I'm, it's so cool. I'll get there. Yeah. That's so cool. Um, what is your greatest challenge when dealing with fear and how have you overcome it? Um, so fear is, okay. So I'm like, I, I'm scared all the time. Like I'm, I, I'm in a, a place where I am constantly doing things that scare me. And, um, I, I started doing, actually, you know, I, after college again, that was sort of when I was sort of in a weird place. Uh, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. That's when I started doing a lot of stuff that scared me. So I, I took that fight, which was terrifying. Oh, that was like the most scared I've ever been. Um, and then after that, I moved down to South America. That was, that was really scary. And then uh, after that, I like, uh, I don't know, I would, I would do, I'd take another fight. And then I moved to New York City and that was really scary. And then I, I, would, I would keep doing these big things that were really scary because I really wanted to um, sort of dull down that sense of fear, right? The more scared I was, the more accustomed to it I was, the more I was experiencing all these like sympathetic, like uh, nervous system effects. Yeah. And so I could better be aware of them and uh, control them. And so now in school, I get it all the time because I take tests all the time. That's a huge, uh, th that's a huge, uh, I mean, I don't want to say fear of mine, but that's a huge stress, stressful mm -hmm. situation. I take tests mm -hmm. and I, I, people come up to me and they tell me that, um, like, wow, I'm so relaxed. How do you handle right. school? Like, how are you not freaking out? Like, I like studying with you because you're not anxious all the time. It's like, because yeah, I, this is a test. I'm not getting into a cage and getting my, my yeah. face punched off. Right. Um, but also I'm used to it, right? This isn't the scariest thing I've ever seen. I keep trying to put myself into scary situations. So I don't expend all this energy I mean, just being scared. I mean, the the adrenaline dump in a fight is one of the most shocking things you'll ever feel. Like right? you're in a fight and you're like, all of a sudden, I'm so tired and I've barely done a round. It's been like one minute, like two minutes, and you can barely lift your arms up. Yeah, exactly. You're like, what just happened to me? It's complete exhaustion. I mean, I know I've experienced it one time, and I was like, wow. So it's, it's you kind of got to get over that. Like you, you have to go in. It's like your initiation to to that experience, and then you're like, okay, I get it. And then you and then you have that. Then you become more relaxed. It's a learning. yeah. But then you realize you realize that fear is such a waste of energy. Yeah. It's like if you're afraid, like yeah. I don't know. You're you're just wasting so much energy that you could be using to to perform. So again, I'm talking about like energy conservation because that's just such a huge thing for me. The more I don't have I don't have the energy to be afraid of things. So I'm going to keep putting myself in these scary situations and learn how to overcome it because when something like when something really scary happens to me, I'm going to still need to function in society. I'm going to need, I'm still going to need to get things done. And, uh, I, I need to be able to control that. So and, what, uh, what's your self talk? Like say, you know, like when you were, you know, you're overcoming that, that, uh, initial fright or flight or flee, you know, like that, that real, you know, survival mode kind of thing, especially, you know, what, what's the, what have you trained yourself self talk wise? What do you do? What's, what's an exercise that you might do or you find that yourself is it, is it something that you do consistently the same all the time? If you put yourself in a scary position or is it something unique all the time? Well, so the first thing is, that my, before I do something kind of scary, my body sort of recognizes it even before I do. Mm -hmm. And my heart will start beating a lot and I'll get a little bit anxious. So this happens before tests a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have a lot of stuff I need to get done. I'll have a test um, and it'll be like a couple weeks or it'll be like a week out or even like a few days out. Um, and I notice that I'm stressed all the time. I'm like, wait, why am I so stressed? I'm going through my day or like I'm getting really tired all the time. Mm -hmm. So First, I'm really aware of my heart rate. I'm very aware of 
if I'm stressed, my emotional state, um, and like if something's a little bit off, right? If something's a little bit like I'm, I'm just a little bit too um, agitated. Uh, I'm, I'm, I first recognizing, I first recognize it as it is. I recognize it as, um, oh, this is anxiety because of this. I identify why this anxiety is taking place. Mm -hmm. And then my self-talk is like, you're, this is my body getting ready for battle. Okay. So I understand that this is my body. This isn't emotional. So any, a lot of times we tag emotions onto our body state mm -hmm. like so we we have all this like this increased heart rate we're a little bit more um revved up it's really easy to attach emotions to it i detach the emotions immediately so it's not fear it's not stress it's not sadness sometimes i'm like oh i'm so lonely i've been training i haven't seen anyone for like i get so dramatic i get so dramatic <laughs> in my head i'm like what if i can never do this again and it's it's, I have this whole conversation and then I recognize it for what it is. Uh -huh. It's increased heart rate. This is my body getting ready, getting itself ready for battle. Mm -hmm. And I breathe and I, I use it, right? Anxiety is an adaptive tool. It gets us ready. Mm -hmm. like, it, it gets us working harder. It gets us um, ready for battle essentially. And yeah. uh, if, but if you use that, energy that sympathetic tone to be emotional mm -hmm. and, and attach it to an emotion then you're not using it for battle you're using it for this emotional response i try to channel it into what i'm doing i use that extra energy for what i'm doing mm -hmm. and uh that's really really a lot easier said than done Mm -hmm. because sometimes I do get like that and then I hide in my covers and I say I don't want to see anyone anymore like I I quit but <laughs> you yeah. but then eventually you're like all right get over it you're dramatic yeah, yeah. Just use this extra energy you have and apply it to what you need done mm -hmm. um so that's my self-talk that's pretty cool that's that's actually I mean you know changing changing or disrupting the thought patterns you yeah. know like that so, yeah immediate wow. like, thought patterns where that are self-defeating scared yeah, yeah. But it takes it takes a lot of self-awareness and a lot of exposure to this kind of situation so which is why i try to put myself in stressful situations as much as possible and uh i i i'm really quick to recognize now when my heart rate starts to increase when anxiety starts to kick in and i quickly say all right body is turned on how am i going to use this extra energy yeah wow that's that's great information for people i think that don't know how to manage their their emotional state or anxiety or you know there's so many instances that we come across that but do you do you feel like too that you kind of learned that through your martial arts training too that helped 100 percent, 100 percent. and and the the best part the the thing about martial arts that really helped me is um with jujitsu Again, it's, uh, I mean, that's the most humbling sport and, uh, because you get beat up every single day yeah. and some days, and, you know, especially if you're in a fight camp and you're tired and like people you normally would beat up and they beat you, that's so like, ah, uh, that's so frustrating. Mm -hmm. and, and, you, and you're, you're so proud and you're like, I'm not going to let them win. I'm not going to like be okay with this or you beat yourself up. Mm -hmm. But then at a certain point, like you do enough fight camps, you're just like, I'm, I'm just like, I'm too tired to care about whether I'm winning or losing. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get through my day at this point. And that, and that I learned from martial arts and, and that has helped me in a lot of ways because I'm not worried about the people around me. Mm -hmm. I'm very worried about, like, I'm, I'm worried about myself. I'm pushing myself as far as I can. I mean, competition is great and you're, you should push yourself. But when it's taking energy away from you and you're worried about stuff that doesn't matter, you're worried about losing this one grappling match or this one sparring session. Um, maybe today I didn't perform as well as I wanted to, but uh, I, if you dwell on it again, it's the same thing with fear. It's just a waste of energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's martial arts. I mean, because I do it every single day, I lose every single day. I get beat up every single day. There's no day where I'm like, 
wow, I'm the best in the room. Like, and yeah. you know what? Honestly, that's the best part about being a woman in martial arts. Mm. Honestly, I mean, people, it's, it's really easy to talk about like, oh, it's hard being a woman in the sport because people say like disgraceful things to you. Like they treat you differently and there's all this other stuff. But I, I love it so much more than being like a big, strong guy because I will never be the best person in the room. Mm -hmm. And I will always have training partners and I will always like have to out like outsmart people it, like anybody who's bigger than me. I mean, there's just so much room for growth. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'm just imagine being that big guy mm -hmm. who like, and I, and I see it all the time. I see these big guys and they're not, they, they'll win fights or they'll, they'll do well in the gym, but they, they're not good. Like they don't have that technique. They don't have that. Like, and, and they don't have that mental toughness a lot of times because they're not being crushed every single day. I get crushed every single day and I've become so okay with that and I've learned to love it and I've learned to really like, like I'm really able to identify people who don't have that experience in the gym and I, and that makes me even more grateful for having that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm being humbled by your opponents, you know, or your, your training partners is a huge part of it. And I think women, definitely, uh, that will happen more so than say the guys, just like you're saying, do you, um, do you, have you ever felt, um, kind of inadequate or were you ever told no, because you're a woman, um, either in the gym or, or even outside, like in your early or earlier years? Um, I mean, yes. And like the, the first, like, yes, but in no way that I, I couldn't handle or I couldn't face. And again, it comes, it's, it's a lot like what I was just saying that like, I've learned to really appreciate some of that stuff. Like I like kind of appreciate being stepped on and then fighting back and then getting better and like using that as growth experiences um, there, there, and, and it's because like, I don't know, I've, I've, I've been lucky to be in like situations that are very careful to like be politically correct and put myself in, which actually sometimes makes it worse. Mm -hmm. Um, cause it's very superficial political correctness and it, it's not great, but, uh, Never but people won't overtly say like, you can't do this because you're a woman. Like they won't say that to your face. Yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll do they'll little it. things. <laughs> what? They'll think it. <laughs> they'll think it. They'll yeah. think it. And they'll say little things yeah. that like, j that just sort of chip away at you yep. and you learn to deal with it and you learn to recognize it. And, uh, and that's the biggest thing that I feel like that's, that's what I, when I feel would like. It, would it ever occur to you to do that to someone else? No, I yeah. would never, I would never it talk just, to someone. Does, no way. I, I know it doesn't occur to me to do it, but I think I have learned how to do that now. Yeah. You know, because it's been done to me so much that I, I have kind of learned how to do it and I will kind of retaliate sometimes if I know it's being done to me. And yeah. I have to kind of learn to taper that back now. Like I, I know like about two years ago, I, I was experiencing a little bit more where I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna just spin the coin here and do that back to you. Now I don't do it, but I know I had to like. <laughs> That's, well, no, it's good self-awareness. You know, sometimes they, they oh. need it. But you know what? So the biggest thing for me is in what's great about where I train now at Henzo's is that there is a really good group of women there mm -hmm. and they're good. Like they're really good. And they're also like insane alpha females with like careers and like, you're talking to me, like, I'm like, I'm pre-med. Like, that's great. Well, these girls like have like careers and they're fighting and they're nasty. And like, they're like, they're better than the guys who we train with and like technically like way more advanced. But what's great about having them is that, like, you don't even realize when guys are talking down to you sometimes. Like, there are sometimes I, I know they are. And then a lot of times you don't even notice because you're so used to it. Mm -hmm. But we talk about it. And, like, sometimes if, like, you feel a little weird about how, some, like, somebody said something, uh, we talk about it and we joke about it. And, it's, and they have the same experience and they, they feel it too. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's really nice. I don't know. It's really nice to have that support. 
And, and what's amazing is that, and, and the biggest difference I think is between men and women in this sport is like, I, again, I'm, I'm using my teammates as an example. They, they're really experienced. They're more experienced than a lot of the guys that are there. And the guys will start coaching them on certain things. And again, there is a place for like certain kinds of coaching and they're trained to be very receptive to everybody, even if they have less experience, even if they don't really know, like, I don't know, they're, they're just more receptive to the criticism and the explaining and stuff. Whereas if you say something to a guy, like a girl says something to a guy, they're really quick to dismiss you because they're not used to girls telling them what to do or like they're bigger. So they know more like that doesn't make any sense. But, but it's, it's fun because like I'm constantly, it's, it's hard to differentiate between like stuff that's worthwhile and that I should hold on to like useful information. That's good coaching. Mm -hmm. And then just a guy listening to himself talk. Yes. Um, and that's where it's good to have that sounding board because we'll, we'll make jokes about these guys that will come up to us and like tell us how we're doing. And uh, it's, it's nice to know that it's like, wait, no, I, I know what I'm doing. These people around me know that I know what I'm doing. I don't need to listen to this guy. Like, because sometimes somebody tells you something and you're like, wait a minute, am I really like not doing this right? Or like, why, like, what, like, what does this mean to my training? Yeah. Second guessing yourself or something. I, I think there's been a lot of, I, I know, you know, it's, it's changing of course, but like, you know, being put in that position where you thought you knew something and then somebody's showing you a different way to do it. And you're like, no, that's not right. And then you second guess yourself when, when you know that you learned it from maybe the head instructor exactly yeah. from them and they're it telling happens. you and they're telling you, yeah, you're doing it right. And then you have somebody else coming and I've had that happen so many times. It's not even funny. And then you know, Anybody in the Shelly, you're right. Just do it that way. Don't listen to them. They'll tell me after cause I'll go to them and I'll ask them, you know, and I'm like, ah. Yeah, it's exhausting and it's hard to navigate. They get and pissed at you. They get pissed at you if you question them. Like, oh, they do. Them. Yeah. They oh, yes. And you're I've like, got so many stories about that. It's just, it's it, like if a guy did that, would you would you still be pissed? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I I like I have to get off to ask some guy like would like if you if if guys experience that at all. And I'm sure they do in they certain do, levels. But not as much, maybe. I don't know. Oh, definitely not as much. But again, so here's the thing. One of the reasons why I love being a woman in this sport, yeah. is, well, everybody loves to coach me, so I get a lot of extra coaching. That's and good. The, the trick is weeding out the stuff. And that, well, the thing that can be tricky is uh, weeding out the stuff that doesn't matter. Yeah. But again, we are, as women, kind of trained to listen Yep. a lot more than men are really trained to listen. So I get a lot of, pe like, I see, I get a lot of coaching mm. and I am glad that I can listen to it and apply it if I want to. Mm -hmm. Whereas I also see a lot of guys who get this coaching and they quickly shut them down and are like, like, mm. oh, like they don't know anything. Like I'm the alpha, like blood. Mm. They're, they're very, they're not receptive to coaching. And that's something that I have learned to value, right? Mm -hmm. I'm lucky that people want to help me. Yeah. I'm lucky that I get to see things from different perspectives. Yeah. I need to be really cognizant of what's like, what's worth listening to or not. Yeah. But I, I can learn from everybody that I train with. And I do learn from everyone that I train with. So I try to keep, I try to adopt uh, a, a point of view where I, I listen to everything that's thrown at me and I weed through it and I try and I try to apply it the best that I can because mm -hmm. that's going to make me better. That's what's going to make me get so much better than that big guy in the corner who is beating everybody up because he's so much bigger than everybody. But then when he gets told advice, he, he dismisses it because he's, he's winning with his big like left hand or, or his big right hand, whatever. Right. And that can only take you so far as opposed to learning, like, say, proper technique and, and really kind of executing the proper technique, say, in a jujitsu class or something like that. Yeah. But it's fun. It's fun to laugh at the yeah. boys. Like, at yeah. the end of the day, like, the things that people say to me are so ridiculous. Or, like, when they say, like, oh, like, I didn't realize we were going hard because I tap them out or, like, I – you know those oh, little, that said or, too. oh i i like you're you're like you're strong for a girl like kind of trying to make it feel like i i don't know like they let me win I, it's just funny and and we laugh about it at the end yeah. of the day because you know what you can't not laugh about it because you know what they're going through something too 
Like, I mean, as like, I don't really care that they're going through something because I go through it every day, yeah. but you got to like give them the credit of saying like, well, I just like smashed your ego. I'm going to give you a minute to process it. Uh-huh. And uh, you can say whatever you want to me to make yourself feel better, but I know that I just smashed you and it feels great. Yeah. The, the yeah. thing is that happens at the lower levels the most. Yes. You get, when I, I was doing a the jiu-jitsu club at Columbia for a little while, which is a lot of um, white belts, a lot of people who aren't really familiar with the sport. Right. And you would, and I, and I, I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm a blue belt. I'm not like crazy up there, but I've been doing jiu-jitsu for a while. Right. I'm pretty good at it and I'm super strong. So I can go, I, I go, I do really well against the big guys. Um, and you would hear little things about like, oh, a, like a, a woman purple belt couldn't be a white, like a male white belt or something like that. And, it, and it, I just laugh at it because it's like they're so clearly don't know anything about the sport. Whereas the people who are high belts, they know that girls can kill them. Yeah. And then I go with them and I like, I, I kick their ass and, and then they, then there's like all these excuses. But you know what? That's part of the jujitsu. Like that's part of the growing process for, for the, the men in jujitsu, right? That's, that's part of it. But it's very clear to see huh. like people who have trained at high levels or have had good training partners, their attitude towards women is so much different than people who have not had that much experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really, that, that's a great, great um, observation. You know, the whole cycle of training and the years and years of practice that it takes to kind of actually um, uh, change thought perceptions. Well, I had it too. Like what, before I started, before I started martial arts, I always thought it was stupid, like in movies when the girl was like beating up the guys. I'm like, that could never happen. Um, I, I played sports my whole life and I'm, I'm, I was a tough kid. And uh, I, I always thought like, oh, I couldn't play on the boys soccer team. I couldn't pay, play on like the boys hockey team. I just like don't have the skill. Um, I, I don't have the body. Like I can't, like I can't keep up with them. And in some ways it's, it's, true but i'm i've learned a lot more that it's a lot more fluid than that it's not like men are better than women it's there's a lot more fluidity there mm-hmm. um and you can get women who can get up to like those high levels yeah. um but i i never thought that like a girl and a boy fighting a, that a girl could win yeah and now it's really either but now i i see that in some cases that a woman could you know out outsmart and outwit and then you know through through the physical motions of whatever and and have an edge yeah and it's and it's funny it's funny to me when you make the the comparison between like like oh well there's no girl fighter in the ufc that could beat up like uh, a a man fighter or whatever but it's like yeah well you also don't have like a, a welterweight going against like a like a bantamweight guy or like a 125 or a flyweight guy right those are weight classes like you might have an amazing flyweight but he would still lose to this giant guy because of like certain reasons and you still like are you still want to watch that flyweight because he's really good i i just i see i see like the women's division as like a different weight class they're just as good as these guys but there's just a different body that's being in play and so we separate them and we let them fight it's the same thing. It's the same, like, it's the same spectrum. It's, it's, it's not less technical or less. Oh yeah. Um, good. It's, it's just, it's a different weight class. You, you, you watch the 125 guy and you watch the 250 pound guy. Like you, you watch all of them and you respect all of them. How come you're not respecting the women? Yeah. And, and the women's fights, they offer so much more variety than, than that you won't see with the men, like the flip issues that women have and the, the positions that they can get into that you're like that was crazy how did she do that or whatever you know you're like how did she survive that arm bar her, her arm looks like it was bent in you know the other way Seriously. And, you know and you're like how did and she she doesn't have an issue with that like later on it's fascinating to me that the bodies could be so different and and what what you know what you're observing in a, a female fight the speed the, there's so many differences and it's it's really kind of cool what what the women will do in a fight 
as opposed to what you'll see, say, the guys do. I, I just think they're always amazing. I, I you know, like you, you'll see sometimes a better performance out of the women's fights than you will with the men because they're oh. they're, they're more they're hungrier. They're like I, you know, like I want to be here. I'm gonna I'm gonna rip this other girl's head off or something, you know? Yeah. More aggressive, all that, but I don't know. But it's, it's, it's fun, like, it, I think the UFC has done a great job of, like, kind of showing that and sort of yeah. introducing that uh, to the world. Mm -hmm. Because, again, I, like, I can't blame a lot of these guys because I had that same attitude towards women because, I mean, that's sort of how I grew up. The girls were in one side and the boys were in the other. They're different sports. They're different. I mean, they, they have different experiences. One can't play with the other. Mm -hmm. And then now that I'm training with guys, like – I, uh, I, I was telling you this story the other day about how uh, Marcelo, our, one of our jiu-jitsu coaches, would, uh, whenever there was a new guy in class, like those big like CrossFit or muscle guys, he would always have me roll with them to sort of decide whether they had the character to come back. Because I, I would poke them out, I'd, I'd, I'd submit them, and we'd kind of we'd look at how, what the attitude of the guy, and if if he could handle it, he'd come back. If he didn't handle it, then we don't want you back, right? Right. We understand that jujitsu isn't about who has like the biggest muscles, who is the biggest, or like who is built this certain way. It's about technique and it's about knowing and, and more than that, it's about knowing the tools of your own body. Yeah. Being able to use your body. Again, huge themes of what I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Know who you are and being able to utilize your strengths. Yeah attack somebody else and uh i i think that's hilarious and it's and it's so eye-opening for so many guys when they come in and their first oh, role sure. and they have no idea what to do and yeah. they i i just smother them yeah. and uh and i and i love that and i i really do i love that and it makes that actually that's one of those things that is really empowering for me and i feel like uh like i i feel like i get to give back to women in that way Mm -hmm. sometimes I am a little hard on myself I'm like if I see like a real big asshole who mm -hmm. like doesn't want to talk like who doesn't think girls are good and I can't beat them sometimes I'm like oh I put too much pressure on myself I mean eventually he's gonna run into someone the wrong person and he's gonna get put in his place but sometimes there's that pressure of like oh no it's my job to show them I've been doing this training and this is one of this is one of my jobs is to show them that I can beat them up. I can be just as good as them. It's yeah. it's about the time you put in. It's about it's about yeah. what you put into the sport. Absolutely. And I think I've done that a little bit, and I'm I'm yeah. proud of that. I'm really proud of that. Yeah, I, I am too. I, I I mean, like I I completely get what you're saying. I um, jujitsu was a shorter time for me that that I I did that, but I I, I more focused on the the Muay Thai kickboxing, and I can remember some guys coming into sit your tongue. And we would be downstairs and it would be their first class. And then they would do a little, they'd wanted to spar. And it was myself and a few other women that were there at the time. And, and uh, the, the coach at the time was like, ah, I don't know. And then they're like, ah, oh, what the hell? You know, because they, they knew like we weren't going to get out of control, you know, us, the, the women doing it. And the guys, they would have their, their ass handed to them. And they were like, Oh my God, you know, <laughs> Talking, right? and, and then the coach was like, this is what I love about this place. You just teach somebody the technique, whether it's a guy or a girl and they can knock down a big guy, no problem. Put them on their rear ends. And, and, yeah. and, and they, and they're like, oh, wow. And they would come back because they're like, holy crap. And then later on, you know, once they get some skills, they can put me on my butt. <laughs> you, know? But, you know? Yeah. But it's a, it's a, it's an ongoing process. Yeah. And yeah. it feels, it feels really good to be able to like, I mean, I don't know. I, uh, I I don't really consider myself like a huge like activist and like involved in social things very much. But it is nice. Like I do feel like I pull my weight um, on the female side of things because like I, every day I show up to the gym and I and I show one of these guys that I am I'm tougher than them. I'm bigger than them. I'm stronger than them. Like I I could I can beat them up. Like I yeah. I I think that I I'm I'm really proud of that that I get to represent women in that way um that's so great do you feel like um you know you're a role model for other women uh say even at your at school like do they you know like look at you like wow girl you you're gonna get in the ring you're gonna you've been in the cage you've been like 
do you, do you feel like that, um, um, people are fascinated with that and that, that kind of serves as a little bit of a role model because it helps you and assists you in other areas of your life where you had challenges? Yeah. Well, so what's in, what's funny is that I've been like, after school, I was just, I was just so submerged in the fight culture. Like I was around fighters all the time. Um, and now I'm, I'm in school and I forgot that like the socioeconomics are a lot different. Like you, you don't, uh, the, you don't, I don't know. You like, it's a different, it's a different community. And I, and I forgot that in, in school, you don't find a lot of people who are aware of what fighting is. Yeah. Right. They are like, they've never like, it's just such a foreign thing. Like it's just completely like they'd never, they'd never even heard of anybody who participated in this. Yeah. They right. Don't they don't have any friends that are in it. <laughs> yeah. And I, and it's, it's funny because like I, I'm just around it so much that I forget about that. Um, but I, like when I was in college and I met somebody who was like a fighter, I was like, holy, like, Ooh, like whoa that's crazy so I get that a lot and I and that catches me off guard sometimes um but they I don't know I I think yeah I, th I think they get really like kind of hyped up about it like that I think the biggest thing especially because it's like such a great school and you get a, so many like really really smart kids there um really passionate about like or not, I'm not going to use the word passion. I'm going to say really uh, focused students, really high performing students. I think they're most fascinated that I have a life outside of school. Yeah. So, so they, again, I, I talk about the anxiety of school and how like a lot of people don't have balance and I'm required to have balance in order to be able to do these two things that I love. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of them look at me and they're like, how do you have, like, how are you so involved in fighting? Like, fighting is a is a job for me it's a full-time job for me um i would say part-time just because i don't i don't do like 40 hours a week but the thing is i go home and i'm still like fighting right i, I go home and i'm meal prepping um i'm exhausted i'm recovering like it's a full-time job if you add up all the hours that i put into fighting and recovering yeah uh, but they they're really fascinated that I can do both of these things mm -hmm. and in that way uh, I think they see me as a role model and that I can uh, I have a lot of um, I'm very calm going into tests and I do what I need to do I don't do extra I don't do less like I I, I get what I need done and I, and I can prioritize things and balance things and that that I don't think a lot of them have seen before mm -hmm. um, I think they're very they're very used to seeing just high performance in academics mm -hmm. and not really, they've never really see, seen that balance before. So it's, it's kind of cool to when people are really surprised and they give me a lot of respect for it. And, and that's really oh, nice. Sure. to hear. Yeah, I'm sure. Because it is, I mean like juggling that I'm like, Oh my gosh, that's a, that's a multitude of, of uh, activity in your life. Like that's huge that what, what you're doing. I'm, you know, pre-med and then, and then the fight game. Do you see yourself, um, you know, eventually going pro or getting back into the cage? I would love to. Um, yeah, I've been trying to figure out when my transition is. Uh, I, I love Muay Thai so much. And like, it's, it's in the community of Muay Thai that I really love. And like, I've got a really great Muay Thai team and um, like, especially moving to a new place, I kind of infiltrated Henzo's through the Muay Thai team and I, I got my respect through like the Muay Thai team and sort of got involved in the culture because um, it's a huge it's a huge tourist destination there's so many people who go there it's such a popular gym mm -hmm. big gym um, it's really hard to find your community there than a lot of gyms that I've been to like up in Boston right. so yeah so I, I found my community through the Muay Thai team mm -hmm. and I want to I want to prove myself through that as much as I can um, but I'm a natural grappler and I haven't grappled in like a couple of years really like seriously. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I still train MMA. I do like MMA sparring once a week. Um, so I'm not completely away from it, yeah. but I'm, I'm a natural, I'm a natural grappler. I'm, I'm built for MMA. I'm not built for Muay Thai. Like yeah. not at all. That's part of why I wanted to do Muay Thai because it's a challenge for me. Yeah. Like that's my striking was way behind my my grappling when I was doing MMA. Yeah. Um, but 
but I want to eventually like fuse them together. And I would like to take a pro fight. That's, that's one of my goals. Like I like down the line, I might be like, that might be, uh, 10 years from now. Um, I don't know, but I'd like to get to that level. It depends on how school goes. Um, but it's, you know, the, the one thing that I've learned is that it's one thing at a time. I can't get ahead of myself because that's when I get overwhelmed. Right. I've got one tournament in a couple weeks yeah. and I might have, I might have a tournament two weeks after this tournament, but I'm not even, I can't even think about that until I do this tournament. Um, because it's one step at a time. Every day I show up to Muay Thai, I get better at MMA. And I, even though I'm like, Oh wait, I need to be doing more grappling. It's like, no, I'm, I'm getting better uh, in certain ways. Cause I'm showing up every single day. Um, I'll figure out a way to develop a style that accommodates the training I've had in jujitsu and the training that I've had in Muay Thai. And, uh, I'll, I'll set up a game plan that way, but you're, but I, I do want to get back into MMA. I don't know if it will be this year, maybe next year. Um, but it's, it's just figuring out, I'm still figuring, I'm still navigating Henzo's and figuring out what coaches I would go to for that and uh, what training would be involved for that because I'm, I'm on a huge Muay Thai kick right now and uh, I, I hate missing days of Muay Thai. When I have to miss Muay Thai to go to jiu-jitsu on certain days, uh, that breaks my heart. Um, so I, I've got to figure out a way to do it. Nice. Well, that's good. You're studying two different, you know, two different arts too. Like, you know, you have to devote the time for a period of time to Muay Thai. You were like devoted to it, uh, the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for a period of time mm -hmm. and it'll all merged together eventually, you know, like it'll all, yeah. yeah, that's really cool. So this was really great. I learned so much today, you know, about yeah. like performance coaching. That's like really cool. I, I, I look forward to hearing more from you next, maybe the next time I see you uh, in New York, yeah, exactly. something, which would be really cool. Um, I wish you well. Is there uh, on your fight? Is that in two weeks or when is that? Yeah. So it's October 19th. Actually, it's on my birthday. Uh, oh, you did. Yeah, I weigh in. I weigh in on my birthday. I'm going to eat an entire cake after I weigh in. <laughs> That's my plan. I don't know if my coach will be happy about that, but <laughs> that's my plan right now. You'll be on um, so October 20th, I'm fighting. So not this weekend, the following weekend. My, my water cut starts on the, ah, my water cut starts tomorrow. So I'm going to be water loading tomorrow and then slowly starting to cut it out. Well, this um, was so great um, going over all this stuff with you. Would, do you have any, um, any shout outs or anything that you'd like to say in, in parting? Um, you know, uh, well, thank you for talking to me. I, it's really fun. To, I, I love this stuff. So I could talk about this all day, every day. Um, but, but I mean, thanks to my team and for getting me here. Thanks to, uh, John Connors for getting me into this sport. Um, thanks for, thanks to Henzo's for pushing me into it, like at the next level, Rajasi Muay Thai for getting me started in Muay Thai. I mean, and thanks to my parents to, for, making me have life goals outside of <laughs> just fighting or I don't know, whatever I dream up every single day. But uh, yeah, no, that was, uh, that was a great talk. I really appreciate it. Oh, it was awesome. And I think it'll help uh, a lot of people when they listen in to hear about what your challenges were, how martial arts has helped you and what you're doing now, which is so amazing. Um, you know, the, 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 the career path that you have kind of set forth for yourself and uh, your plans. I think it's really exciting and I wish you the best and I hope you have a great tournament in two weeks and happy, thank you. happy uh, early birthday. And, oh, thank you. And uh, all the best to you, Rebecca. It was really Thank you. Really I will say that the one thing that I would like, like I, from all of this, that I think that I uh, would like to communicate is, uh, especially for ADHD, in terms of ADHD, um, a lot of times it can feel like everything that you do is a lot harder than it is for the person sitting next to you. But the reality is that there's a lot of things that are a lot easier for you than it is for them. It's just about conserving energy and all the, all the stuff that's really hard, right? Setting up routines to get around the stuff that's hard, setting up strategies to get around the stuff that's hard so you can focus all your energy on what makes you really great um, and better than the average person, better than the person without the disability even. So um, I think that's sort of what a lot of this stuff sort of like revolved around and uh it was it was cool to work out with you even in my head so yeah, yeah that's
so cool. The biological masterpiece in, in, in progression. I love it. Yes, the biological <laughs> masterpiece in progress. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks again, Rebecca. All right, take care. You too. If you liked what you heard today and are eager to hear more, remember to subscribe or download on iTunes. Or also, I mean, you can just, you know, Google us, Evolve WMMA, and you're going to find me in a lot of different spots. You can listen on uh, Patreon. You can listen on Spotify under Women's MMA. Uh, we're also on YouTube. We're on um, a bunch of other um, Shout Engine. Uh, and then th we have other listings that um, I'm just, th this, this has been appearing on, which is really awesome. Um, or you can simply follow us at facebook.com backslash I love WMMA. This is Shelly Devine. Until next time.